have in the heart of the issue. Pass one over here. Here's one for you, sir. Brad, do you need one? All right. Here you go. So it's uh, right at the 
I don't know where it is on your page, but verse 15, where he talks about this free gift is not like the trespass, but it's in 14, sorry. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the, trust, the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. How was how was Adam a type for the Messiah?
That's another type for the Messiah. Because he was a shepherd and he was the king of Jerusalem. But yet, you have King David being uh, called in him Lord. Right? So you have these little... Do you understand what I'm saying by the word type? Or is it kind of being lost a little bit? Yeah. Maybe an image we could think about would be uh, we use the word prototype. Prototype, yeah. And uh, if you think of the airplane that the Wright brothers flew versus the most advanced jet today, that was a prototype. And I got the, the finished product. And it's, it's a type, prototype. Yep. For the Savior. For the Savior, yes. And then, yeah, exactly. Did God know there would be a second out? Yes. And see, and that's, well, he had foreknowledge of it, right? Yeah. And, and that's why, you know, even like last week when I was talking about some of the most profound words in, in all the scripture are the, one, the very first ones that God speaks. Because if God knew of the possibility of having to become man and flesh and bleed and die and to suffer in the way he did, to bear the sins of the world, why did he still utter the words uh, uh, that he will... Uh, Create, that he decided to create Adam and Eve in his image. And why did he still continue to do these things? So, it's a really profound and really powerful statement. When you think of all of the things that God foreknew, yet still desired to move towards. Okay. Any questions about question six? We look at Adam as a type. <coughs> so Adam's a type, right? But the transgression isn't like the gift. Because the transgression, one sin is the effect of the world. And you have this one, uh, this one act of grace by this one individual instead of corrupting and destroying. It's not like that in the way that it brings life and salvation. Any thoughts or questions about that? Another question? Okay. All right. All right, good. All right, let's go to question seven then. It says, looking at both 14 and 15, what impact does this understanding on have on seeing Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life from John 14, 6? So what do you think? What is Paul echoing here, or, or is he contradicting it, or what is he doing with 14 and 15, where he talks about, yet the death reigned for Adam and Moses, or even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one that is to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of of the one man, of that one man, Jesus Christ, the power for many. So what is Paul? What is Paul doing for Jesus' words? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Why is it the only way that you can come to the Father? Let's look at it through the, the lens of what Paul's writing in Romans 5. What evidence or argument is Paul making in regard to Jesus being the only way, truth, and life? He's basically saying this plan. This is God's plan and there hasn't and there will never be a plan B. This is plan A. And that God has come and he has redeemed his people. And he's restored them. He's forgiven them. He's given them this free gift of grace. And it's because he deigned it uh, necessary. And that is what he did. And so it's not like Jesus is just standing on the plane somewhere in John 14, and giving this sermon and saying, I'm the way, truth, and life. 
He's actually, Paul is maybe even unpacking that statement a little bit for us by saying, yes, he's the only way, truth, and life because he is the new Adam. He is the one that was promised all the way back in the garden. He is the seed of Eve that is to crush the head of Satan and to restore mankind. This is the way, the truth, and the life. This isn't just a, a prophet or some really eloquent speaker there you know, convincing the masses that his teaching is the right way. He literally is the man. He is Adam. I had one pastor, a Presbyterian pastor in Port Angeles, and he stood up in front of the congregation. There was this collective that they wanted all of us to get together and do a workshop on, on the truth of Scripture. He stood up in front of the whole congregation because there was people from different denominations all represented there. And he used this passage from John 14, 6, and he said, Jesus said, I'm the only, only way, truth, and life. But he isn't talking about himself. He's talking about his teachings. Is teaching to love God and to love your neighbor. He's not talking about the man, Jesus. Yes, he is. How can you say that? Because of Romans 5. Paul is unpacking for us something that a lot of the world is trying to chip away at. Reduce Jesus to maybe just a bunch of moral statements of what you do or shouldn't do in this life in order to earn your salvation. But in reality, Paul is saying that the man is, is the Savior. He is the way, the truth, and life. It's almost like John the Baptist from this morning in our, in our Gospel text where he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's Jesus. It's that person. Like what Mary, you were saying, this holy, innocent, blameless sacrifice, this only begotten Son of the Father, whom He loves. You know, everything that we're getting this time of the year for Epiphany, really unpacking the identity of who Jesus is and how important it is that we do that. Because it's really easy to just be kind of on the surface <laughs> and to fall into some of those traps of reducing Christianity or religion or even Jesus to a bunch of sayings or moral teachings, but in reality He is the solution. The only solution. Nobody else died for you on the cross. Nobody else exchanged His life for yours. No, no Brahmin God from Hindu uh, religion no Muhammad or any of these other prophets that say they're, they're higher ranking than Jesus. None of these individuals did that. Only one. And that's why you can stand in all these places where people say, how can you say that? How can you say that Jesus is the only way, truth, and life? Because he's the only one that did this. He is the new Adam. What do you think about this? Yeah, I'm just wondering why there's so many who believe that he's just a prophet. Because it makes it easy. Because if you can bring God down to us, so what Dave's <coughs> question was, it's what makes it confusing on why people reduce him to a prophet. Because if you can take Jesus and bring him down to us, then you can now discredit him. Right? Now all of a sudden, he's no different than you and me, except maybe he made some better choices in life. Or he was you know, taught by some monks in India or something like that. You know, you bring him down to make him fallible so that you can challenge some of his teachings. So, I mean, there's, there's two ways of discrediting God. One is to raise himself above him, and the other is to bring him down to us. And, and both of those things are making God in our own image. Any, any other remarks? Are coming in? Quiet today. I thought with ice cream, <laughs> there a little bit lively discussion. We're gummy bears. But there was a squat side of it. Keep small peas. He just got the whites back there. Thank you for bringing that up too, right? Because we, and, uh, the statement was. Is Yes, Jesus was the only one that died.
died for us, but the other part of that is he is the only one that was raised to life. He is the only one that is still reigning. The one that is in heaven. I mean, this is the whole thing. If you think about it from Revelation, is it 4 or 6? I don't know. Where they're talking about the whole company of heaven is crying and grieving and mourning. Because no one is in heaven that is worthy to unseal the scroll of God. And the scroll is the story of salvation. No one is worthy to do it. Until one rises up where you have the elder comforting all the heaven saying, there has been one now that is worthy. The lamb that was slain is worthy to unseal the scroll. And so it's not just like there are, so going back to the statement, is, this is, there aren't many or multiple. There is one in heaven and on earth, one that has made the worthy sacrifice to bridge humanity and to, un, or to reveal for us the scroll of God's salvation. Seminar you were at when that gentleman spoke up and said that. Yeah. The lead in your pencil must have snapped right there. <laughs> <laughs> Cannon fodder for children or for children. This is for uh sir, for her Bible study. But see, it's and I'm not picking on different church bodies, right? Because I have friends in a variety of church bodies that wouldn't would just heal over if they heard things like that. Well, and, and so it's you got to remember that it's not. I'm not trying to just pick on certain different bodies. You have to you have to open your ears to hear and, and discern the messages that are being talked to you. And for individuals that you know have reduced Jesus to a bunch of moral teachings, then that would sound perfectly okay. And in fact, it would it would be encouraging. Because now we can believe in false things. Like there might be multiple ways to love God and love our neighbor. And it's for you to figure that out. That means that if I'm loving God and loving my neighbor, what is that, by the way? Is that law or gospel? That's law. That's law. So I'm saved by loving God and loving my neighbor. So there's your first stumbling block. Because are you ever going to be able to do that? No. No. Okay? The other thing is, is now it's up to you to decide in your spiritual journey how to do that. See, and that's the thing. Is it, it takes Jesus. When you remove Jesus from the cross, you take Christianity and you make it hall. You make it all about just a moral, social club that gets together. You have to keep Christ in the church. But I'm preaching to the choir, right? <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's keep going a little bit. So seven, just to sum it up, what impact does that have to understanding? That's why I capitalized the word the word the. There is probably, and I you know, this is something that you probably heard me say before because I think it's worth repeating, is the word the is the most powerful word in the English language. It just is. Because you can have a word or a God. But when you say the Lord, the God changes everything. When you say I am the life, the resurrection, it changes all of it. And this is where you have Paul with Romans 5, 14 and 15, really highlighting and raising up, I guess you could even say, the word the. The word the is very powerful. And he is saying, this Jesus is the way. It has the grace, the gift. Yeah. There, that's just that question. All right, let's go to verse, or question 8. It says, throughout verses 14 through 16, Paul describes the nature of this gift. What word does he use? And what word is significant of this type of gift? What does he use over and over again? I mean, he uses the word gift. But what kind of gift? Free. Free. Why would we need to... You would think that the word gift by itself would stand alone. What is a gift? 
Well, no, I mean, what is a gift? Just, just talk about a gift of nature. Just in, in the nature of a gift. What is it? Yeah, something that you didn't earn, right? You know, all of those diamond rings that you got for Christmas this year, right? <laughs> I'm sure you earned those, but, uh, <laughs> but that's the thing about a gift. A gift by its nature is something that is given, bestowed to you from outside of you. But Paul, there's a reason, I mean, this, this should highlight, you know, almost stand up off the page, the fact that he is over and over and over again giving us the nature and defining this gift for us even one step further than what's necessary. It's a free gift. And then, what is the gift? Grace. What is grace? Something else you don't earn. Something else you don't earn. And so here when we're talking about Paul describing this free gift of grace from God, he is doing it emphatically so that you, through repetition, you see, and it's inescapable, that there's nothing here that you've earned, but everything in here you have acquired and have been given. And how beautiful that is. So, I kind of answered the question for you without a whole lot of discussion. Paul describes the nature of the gift. What is significant about this gift? What does he want you to be hit over the head with multiple times as he's marching through this text? No more ice cream. Bless you and bless the family. Or you can put it in the closet. 
Well, what happens eventually? The whimpering stops eventually. So that's where we have, there's really not, I know it's sad, it's a horrible analogy, but it's, you know, and, but that's the, the essence. Why? Right? You don't have any belief or faith. See, those are the, you know, where you talk about individuals that, that just say, I, I don't believe in any of that stuff. The, the work of the Holy Spirit is one of those hidden things of God. And those are the things that we oftentimes have the hardest part of, right? where you have these passages that talk about where the Spirit moves, where it wants to, or, uh, you know, my ways are higher than your ways. And you have individuals in this life that maybe have been given all the opportunities in the world. Maybe they grew up in a Christian home, right? Or they had Christian neighbors, best friends were Christian. Maybe they went to Sunday school, confirmation or what have you. And they're, you know, and they're now in their 30s. And they say, no, I don't believe in any of that. You know, stop. I always tell people, listen to what they have to say. Be part of their life. But remember that this is just part of their story. The spirit is living and active. And that means that where they are today isn't where God wants them to be. But that, and because they're rejecting him or saying they don't believe in him, doesn't mean he doesn't exist. It doesn't mean he's not working on them. And what somebody might say to you might not actually be what they believe. I don't know if this ever happened to you too. Someone who's, I can't believe, I can't believe in a God that would send his children to hell. I've heard that before. Well, okay, so let's unpack that. Right? And so a lot of times when you have individuals that just have these blanket statements, there's a lot of material underneath. And usually a lot of trauma. Right? That when someone says, I won't believe, uh, uh, I, I, I just don't believe in, in all that stuff. You look at what experiences that they had to lead them to that. The, you know, and, and yeah, I think that's about, I mean, I didn't answer your question at all, just kind of danced around it, but the thing is, is, you know, why is it that some people, you can look and have a conversation with them, and they can announce all this faith, and you can see it, and some people will reject it. It's the same thing with individuals on the inverse that might come to church every Sunday, might say all the right stuff, but really in their heart don't believe it. Right? That's why we talk about this in confirmation as the invisible church. And it doesn't matter where you find yourself, whether it's here at First Lutheran or across the street or down at St. Joe's or whatever, it's that saving faith of Christ that lives in us, leads in his promises of death and his resurrection. And we don't know who all is numbered in that church. That's why we call it the Catholic Church. Not the denomination, but the word Catholic means universal. So it's just a mysterious thing. I'm thinking today people that don't understand the concept of the free gift. It might be two reasons. One, they don't feel that they're worthy. Or what's the catch? I think you know if someone says, I guess you've been bombarded with advertising on you get a free gift and you know, what's the catch? You know, you mentioned you're going to get a bill for 40 bucks. You know, the business just sort of postage of your free gift. The gift is free with the shipping and hand. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I think or I'm not worthy of it, you know, how can I possibly receive that? Like, yeah. Well, and I think there's also, you know, and people talk about the church getting older. I have these weird theories that I bounce around in my head from time to time. So what's what Sue was saying is that there, in this today's day and age, a lot of times people wrestle with the idea of believing in this gift simply because they don't either believe that they're worthy to receive the gift. Like God, God can, and I've heard this a lot of times. <laughs> you have two pastors that people will say, well, yeah, I can understand how God can, can forgive you, but you don't know what I've done. He can forgive everybody else except for me. That's that is where you would talk about demonic and spiritual affliction. Where you have people being, 
accused and feeling hopeless in their sin. So being able to move to that. And the other one is thinking, okay, there's got to be a catch. When's the other shoe going to drop, right? Uh, uh, all sorts of... I had one... I had one boss one time. This was when I was first going to the seminary. And I was working on a construction crew. And I was, they were talking about me going to the seminary. And my boss looked at the rest of the guys that were working with me and said, don't talk to him. He's going into church work. Pretty soon he's going to start asking you to put money in the plate. <laughs> What's the catch, Sue? It's, well, we got to make the offering bigger, right? That's what the, the you know, and that's where you have people reducing Christianity to institutionalized religion where all it is is about money and prestige and popularity and things like that. It's shallow stuff. And in reality, without Christ, it is. Because remember, you keep Christ in the church, it's the church. You take Christ out of the church, it's just vain morality veiled in social gatherings where people are doing this kind of stuff. But that's not, that's not what the church is. The other thing that I think is, this is my other theory, to add on to what you were saying, Sue, is that uh, there's a, a lot of, I don't need a Savior. And we're, we're living in a time where, I know this is going to sound cliche, but you know, where everybody gets to run the bases, and everybody gets a medal, and everybody gets a ribbon, and everybody, the, no one's advanced, no one is, uh, you know, struggle, everybody is just the way they, you know, Everything is, huh? Everything's good. Yeah, I paid my taxes. I don't need a savior. Yes. <laughs> but uh, but see, and I think that there, and there is this, uh, there is a line or an underlying issue there when you talk about how everything is going to be given to you. Then why do I need to take things seriously or really examine these things? Um, yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cultural thing that's going on and has been going on since the 60s. I mean, it's this sense of entitlement and things that we have that, that is circulating in our culture. And so it's, you know, but that's why oftentimes like, when we have our November classes, um, I'm not going to say that, but a lot of times the new members, people when they start, uh, that are coming back to the church, what age are they? They're wiser, <laughs> finally mature, right? Well, in some ways, it's not unnecessarily long. Because what comes with age? With, okay, sometimes. <laughs> what else? You don't know what you don't know. You, you know how much you don't know. That's probably the, 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 the hallmark of wisdom right there. The other thing that comes with age is experience, right? And for all of you, what has your experience in your body over the last 10 years taught <laughs> Going down the hill, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, life is, this is, I, 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 I forget who it was that said this. I think it was Augustine or something. He talks about how life is the greatest Life is. And it brings to you things that you cannot run from, no matter how much you work, no matter how much law and stipulations you try to conform your life to. Death comes for what? Death comes for us all. So being face to face with our mortality and our limitations, even forces us at older ages to ask questions about what really matters. I'm optimistic for it, you know. I mean, I know that, you know, people talk about, uh, you know, the church is going, you know, downhill, and the, the people of the pews are emptying out, and all of this. Uh, people.
people are, are still very engaged in their spirituality. The question is, is are we going to be there to speak truth as they're seeking and searching, or are we going to stay silent? The greatest, and this is, this is an analogy that I use in a variety of different settings, the word, every, every moment, every era is a guarded moment where Satan is coming with his lies, questioning if God really says that, and we are all in the place, you and me, or any, any of us, in the place of Adam, because we know the revealed truth. We know God's will. Are we going to stand like Adam and just watch those that we are to care for be taken down by our enemies? Or are we going to speak up? Are we going to learn from our mistakes? And I think that that's the, the biggest thing. And I think you look at it as specifically, you're not putting God in charge. Well, the other thing is it's too pessimistic, and especially when you start getting into some of these individual, some of these things where people are not just pessimistic in their um, in the in their perception of the church, but then they start focusing on the heralding of Jesus coming. Right? That's all that they can focus. On. What can we do to make Jesus come again? When in reality, what is our job here? To share the message of our Lord. It isn't to try to figure out how we can speed up Jesus' arrival or, or any of those types of things. It is to continue to minister to those around us. Luther used to say, you know, if he knew the end of the world was tomorrow, what would he do today? And he said, plant a tree. Knowing that Christ is coming should not change who you are. Alright. That's it for today, guys. So we'll be on the back side to next week and then I'll do a I'll have another worksheet for us as we get as we get in there. So let's pray. Lord, we truly we know that you are the only way, truth, and life. And we live in a world that entices and surrounds us and offers up so many options for us to seek, to run after, to distract us. And we ask that you give us the ability to stand firm in our faith. You move to us through your word and spirit and give us the confidence to stand the day. More than that, that you give us opportunities to, to see the, the, the attacks of our enemy in the world and to give us the courage to speak truth into the lives of so many individuals that are longing for your presence. We ask you to be with us as we go upstairs or return to our homes. I think you feel our lives, our hearts, and our souls with your presence. And Lord, we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.